Good evening, everyone, and welcome once again to our midweek Advent devotional service. This is an exciting Wednesday each year because with the last midweek service, we mark the point where the next time we meet during the week is Christmas Eve. And so it certainly is an exciting time in our worship life, and it's an exciting time of the year. And so in joyful anticipation, we gather one last time around God's Word, knowing that the next time we meet during the week will be to celebrate the birth of our Savior Jesus. So, our lesson for this evening is recorded in Matthew 3, and we'll get to that in a moment. But just a little bit of review for you all. So, when we started off our worship here on Wednesdays, we started at the very beginning. And we looked at the very first story that the Jesse tree teaches each of us. And that's the story about Adam and Eve. And as we looked at those two, we heard the promise of God about a seed. A seed who would destroy the devil and defeat him. Completely wiping away the power of sin and death over each and every one of us. And as we looked through history, we saw how God preserved that promise and passed along the promise of the seed from generation to generation. And so last week, we took a look at Abraham and Isaac. And we saw the faithfulness of Abraham, his absolute trust in the impossible, and the fact that God could do anything. And as we trust in him, we trust that God will do all he has promised for each of us as well. Now, when we pick back up here in Matthew, quite a lot of time has passed. And since the time of Abraham, things have looked pretty dark for the people of Israel. And to illustrate that, you can think of a downward spiral. So, starting off in the book of Judges, we see this pattern repeating itself then throughout the rest of Israel's history. And it all starts with Israel's rejection of God. And this showed itself in all sorts of different ways. Sometimes they turned to idol worship. Uh, sometimes they followed the practices of surrounding countries that didn't believe in God. Whatever that sinful rejection was, it was very clear that they had turned their backs on God. And so because of this, then God sent punishment. He allowed a hostile nation, a foreign nation, to take over the people of Israel and to punish them for their rejection of him. And then as time passed, Israel would repent. They would turn back to God, realizing what they had done was wrong, and ask God for forgiveness. And when they did this, then God would send a leader to save his people. In the book of Judges, that was always a judge, a leader who would rally the people and fight off their enemies. Throughout the rest of their history, it was often a prophet or a godly king. But we call this a spiral, a downward spiral, because as history went on, things got worse and worse. And we saw this cycle repeating itself over and over again. And as history went on, many of the leaders whom God had chosen did things that were less and less godly and more and more sinful. And so you see, as time went on, things kind of spiraled downwards until it got worse and worse, and things seemed hopeless. And so for thousands of years, in a way, God's people had been living in darker and darker times, as more and more of the people rejected God and forgot about that promise of the seed to Eve and to Abraham and to all of Abraham's descendants, like Jesse and David. And yet when things seemed at their absolute worst and darkest, when the Roman Empire stood in control of the people of Israel, then God's gospel, the light of his love, shone through that darkness in the birth of our Savior Jesus. After all, that's why this is such a wonderful celebration. Because when things seem darkest, that Savior was born. The seed who had been promised to Eve was born of a daughter of Eve, a daughter of Abraham and Jesse and David. That son, Jesus, was the fulfillment of God's promise. And the amazing thing was that he was not a king like his descendant David. He was not born in a royal throne room and attended by servants. He was born in a manger. He was born among animals. And yet there, 
the love of God was shown in such wonderful, brilliant light in our Savior Jesus. Now the amazing thing is what we look at today then. So now we fast forward 30 years from there when we take a look at Jesus' baptism. And that's what this symbol, the scallop shell, signifies. It symbolizes Jesus' baptism. And as we remember this story today, as we look at another story on the Jesse tree, we are reminded of Jesus, of his baptism, and the fact that through our baptism, he is a source of life for all of us. Jesus is the life of Jesse's tree. And so now I'd like to read our lesson for this evening. It's recorded in Matthew chapter 3, beginning with verse 14. So, Jesus comes to Galilee, and he comes to be baptized by John. John sees this, and we pick up in verse 14. John tried to deter him, saying, I need to be baptized by you. Do you come to me? Jesus replied, Let it be so now. It is proper for us to do this, to fulfill all righteousness. Then John consented. As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. At that moment, heaven was opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my Son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Now our story today picks up with the people of Israel, with Jesus and John, but it's important to realize the mindset of most of the Jews they probably, more often than not, were taking a look down memory lane. They were looking back at the days of their forefathers, at the days where they had lived free, and they were not under the Roman rule, the tyranny of the Roman government. And yet the thing that they didn't realize is that, well, back then, things really weren't all that great for God's people either. As I mentioned before with that spiral, they were often harassed by outside nations. They were conquered. They were even put into slavery and sometimes even killed. And so in a way, they were looking back at the past with rose-colored glasses, ignoring all the bad things and looking only at the good. And they couldn't see the fact that God had continued to keep his promise throughout all those years. And in fact, if they were standing there on the Jordan River, they would not have looked at Jesus and realized that he was the fulfillment of that. Because on the outside, he looked just like each one of them. And so you have to wonder how they viewed the promise of God. And in a way, the promise, to God, of, of, the promise of God to them probably would have looked something like this. A stump. A stump of a tree that had been cut down. Now, I want you to look very closely at this picture. Ignore all the weeds on the bottom there. Look at this stump. Is there anything that you see there that would make you think that it's alive? And if you have to, pause the video, zoom in on your screen, however you want to do that. Look really closely. Is there anything that tells you it's alive? Tell you what, I'll do even one better. Here's an even closer picture. Now, look really closely. Is there anything alive that you see there on that stump? No? Well, I'll tell you what, let's go closer one more time. Really look close now. Do you see any sort of life here? And the answer for all three of these pictures is no. To, the out, to, to our eyes, these trees, these stumps, look dead. And yet the amazing thing is, even after a tree has been cut down, it is still alive. Its roots are still in the ground, soaking in water and nutrients. And so oftentimes, if the, trump, the, the, the stump is not treated, or if it is not dug out of the ground, several years down the line, it will sprout back into life. It will produce shoots that push up with green leaves and show that, yes, in fact, this stump, this dead-looking thing, is alive. And in a way, that's exactly how the Jews had started to view God's promise. They looked at what God had promised about this seed, and yet all they saw was what they could see with their own eyes. From their viewpoint, God's promise looked like a cold, dead, lifeless stump. 
And yet through all of that, God's promise was hidden in plain sight. If those who had been there on the Jordan had looked at Jesus, they would have seen the seed, but on the outside, there was nothing to indicate to them. All they could see was what was on the outside. And speaking of hidden from sight, it reminds me of something that brought me back to my childhood. Where's Waldo? I mean, I would spend hours looking through these things as I sat in the dentist's office waiting to get my teeth cleaned or sitting in the waiting room at the hospital. It was such a great time waster because you could look at this and take hours to try and find Waldo, who truly was hidden in plain sight. And as soon as you see him, you can't miss him. In fact, he's right there in the middle of it. And so, in a way, this is how the Jews had started to view God's promise. They were looking in all the wrong places. They were looking at themselves. They were looking at their own actions and seeing those as the fulfillment of God's promise, when really they should have been looking inwards at their hearts, at the faith that they had in the coming Savior. And so this is why John the Baptist's ministry was so important, because the people needed to be reminded and refocused on what truly mattered. They needed to be reminded that God desires repentance in our hearts, not just in our actions. They needed to be reminded that God's promise would be fulfilled not in their actions, but in the one who would be born in Bethlehem. And so John spent all of that time preparing the people for the one whom he knew would come. And one day, Jesus does come to him, and John realizes this. John, in fact, was a very humble man, as we saw the last time we looked at John, when he said to all listening that he was not fit to even untie the sandals of the one who would come. And what we read today in Matthew 3 shows that perhaps John's humility even got the best of him at times. Where here he didn't even realize Jesus' true purpose in coming to him. Instead, he only saw himself as worthless, as not worth baptizing Jesus. And so he says to him, I need to be baptized by you. And do you come to me? And yet Jesus reminds him that he was there for a purpose, that he needed to be baptized in order to fulfill God's law. And so Jesus replies to John, let it be so now. It is proper for us to do this, to fulfill all righteousness. And then we see that these words had an effect on John. He consented. He went along with it. And as we heard, there were some wonderful results. The triune God makes himself known, where we see the Father speaking from heaven, the Son being baptized, and the Holy Spirit in the shape of a dove landing on Jesus, indicating to everyone there who Jesus was. He was the seed. He was the fulfillment of all of God's promises. More importantly, he had come and now his ministry would begin in full force. And it's really amazing how this applies to us when we look at where Jesus was baptized. Because he was baptized in the Jordan River, a river that promised life and sustenance to an area that, for the most part, is mostly desert. It is dry. It is a wasteland, just like we were before we believed in Jesus. We were dead. We were completely without life. And that's why it's so amazing that God has given this wonderful gift to his church, the gift of the life-giving waters of the gospel message. Now, the power of this wonderful tool given to the church isn't found in the water itself. It's not even found in the one who performs that baptism. The power of baptism is found in Jesus. The power of baptism is found in the words that he gives to us. I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. That's why baptism is so powerful. Not because of anything we do. Not because of any decision we're making or because the person performing the baptism is so holy or powerful. No. Baptism gets its power. It has an impact because of Jesus and what he did for us. And Paul reminds us of this when we read Romans 6 verse 4. Paul says, We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death 
in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. Life from death. It's a common theme throughout Scripture, and it truly emphasizes just how wonderful of a miracle baptism is. It works incredible life in us where before there was nothing but death in sin. In our baptism, our sins are washed away, and God declares us as his holy and innocent children, those whom he loves and adores. It truly is a wonderful thing and something that we see come into existence here as Jesus was baptized. Now, at Jesus' baptism, he was revealed to be the one whom creation had waited for thousands of years. Creation had waited forever for this to be fulfilled. And it's kind of like this neat little video, right? Now, at the beginning, it looks like nothing but a pot of soil. There's nothing alive there. And then yet, all of a sudden, boom! There is life that sprouts up from this dirt. Life that was always there, just ready and waiting. God's promise was always there with his people. God's promise was always with his people. And then when the time came, when it was God's time, that promise sprung forth into life when our Savior Jesus was born. Showing us that the tree of Jesse never was dead to begin with. It was always alive and waiting to spring forth that shoot that Isaiah had prophesied so long ago. And this also reminds us of one other thing that is incredibly important for us. We are the branches and Jesus is the root of that plant of life. And without that root, we are completely dead. We have no hope when it comes to salvation. And so it is incredibly important for us to remain connected to Jesus, to continue to feed on his word, to be reminded of our baptism and to focus on that, to remind ourselves of the joy and the wonderful forgiveness that God won for us when we were washed in those waters. When Jesus pronounced to all of us that our sins were forgiven. Let that be a wonderful reminder to you to always stay rooted in Christ, to always remain in him through his word and through sacrifice, through, through sacraments. I pray that God will always keep you connected to his Savior Jesus, the life of Jesse's tree. Amen. Now let's all join in a short prayer here together. Lord God, as we see Jesus on the banks of the Jordan River being baptized, we are reminded of the wonderful joy that we have in our own baptism, that we too were baptized along with Christ, and that and just as he died and was raised to life, we too died in regards to our sinful nature. But we were brought forth into new life to lovingly serve you in all that we say and do. Keep us always connected to Jesus, especially in times like this when we are disconnected from each other, when we are even disconnected from meeting together in person to worship you. Help this be a reminder to each of us of the personal devotional life that you want each of us to have, to always be connected to your word, to always feed on it, and look to you for comfort and support. We ask all these things in the name of our Savior Jesus. Amen. And now receive the blessing of the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Before we close out here, just a couple of announcements for all of you. So first of all, I want to remind you all of the email that was sent out last night. Sadly, we will not be meeting in person for the remainder of this month, but instead we'll, be begin, we'll begin our regular in-person worship on January 10th. Um, also connected to that then, uh, you'll see included in the description of the YouTube video, I'll also be emailing it out, and if you've already checked our website, I put together a short little form where it's kind of like the connection cards we'd fill out in church. And this is simply just a way for, on our end of things, to get a grasp of, 
um, who were connected with still, who's able to join in and when they watched. Um, it's also a wonderful way to connect with those who may be visiting with us virtually, where if you've got any questions for me as the pastor, or if you're curious about other things that the Bible teaches us, this is a way for you to reach out to all of us. Um, and then one more thing, just again, a, a reminder to all of you that I'm always available through phone or through email. Please do, if you have any questions, if you need any prayers, whatever it may be, don't hesitate to reach out to me um, and I'll do my best to get back to you. Until next time, when we will meet again virtually this Sunday, I pray that God bless you all and keep you rooted and connected strongly to your Savior Jesus. God bless you all.